Today, I want to speak on a topic that I have titled, Are You Ready for His Gifts? Are you ready for His gifts? And I will mostly tell us a couple of stories. Mostly tell us a couple of stories. Hoping that they will stay and stick and can pass across the message that I want to pass across better than whatever else I may do. Stories have always been ways by which those who teach or who preach can pass across eternal truths. Messages that will reach deep and connect and resonate with individuals who hear it. Jesus Christ used stories a lot that we call parables. And so, I will start with a story that is circular, a story that was told by another human being, okay? And I bet many of you will have heard at least one or two variations of this story. It's a story written by someone, I do not know it's anonymous, but there are at least two different variations of this story. So I will read one of the variations here. And the story goes thus, that there was once a little boy who was playing and then outside saw a very interesting insect. It's a caterpillar. I'm sure we all know what a caterpillar is. I'm not talking of the trucks or the people who make huge tractors. A caterpillar is a small insect that could be about an inch to two inches in length and about a quarter of an inch and they will have tiny hairs around them like a worm and they move by contracting their body like a small tiny snake, a, a tiny worm. So a caterpillar. Now he picked up the caterpillar and took it to his house and showed the mother. And the mother asked him if he could keep the caterpillar and take care of it until that caterpillar would mature and become a beautiful butterfly. Because it's the caterpillars that end up growing up passing through the stages of metamorphosis and become a, 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 a butterfly. So he said, yes, mom, I will do so. So he got a glass jar and put some plants inside because that's what caterpillars eat. And then he put a stick there because they also will often stay on a stick and they must hang upside down on a stick when they are moving from that lava stage into the pupa stage of their metamorphosis before they will come out as the beautiful butterflies that we see. And he continued to come on a daily basis, watching the caterpillar and putting plants there for it to eat. Until one day he came in the morning and saw the caterpillar was acting strangely. He called the mother. And the mother was like, what is happening? And he came and showed the mother what was, what was happening. But what was happening was that the caterpillar was growing into the next stage of his development. It attached itself to one of the sticks and the body started swelling, and it seemed to be shriveling up as well at the same time, bloating up and hardening. It was becoming the pupa stage. It was forming a cocoon around itself. And it became enveloped in that cocoon, almost like something that is dry and bloated. And the mother said, oh, that's the next stage. It is from that cocoon the caterpillar will come out. Not as a caterpillar again, but as a very beautiful butterfly that you love seeing around and that fertilizes our flowers. And so he kept watching. On a daily basis, he would be coming there and check. Several times a day, he managed to escape a lot of the chores at home because the mother was excited and wanted him to see the creation and the handiwork of God in creating things as beautiful as a butterfly. Then one day he came. There was a tiny hole that appeared in the cocoon. And it looks as if the butterfly was going to come out of that cocoon. And he was watching it. And the butterfly seems, or what was going to come out of the cocoon seemed to be pushing itself out. But it looks as if it was having a hard time coming out of that cocoon. It kept seeing it struggle, trying to push itself out. But it's like, this is getting difficult. The young boy, kind-heartedly, felt, look, this is, this is difficult. This caterpillar is not able to come out. It's obviously become a butterfly in the cocoon. But it's finally difficult to come out because it kept struggling, pushing out his leg, pushing out part of the body. Then it will go inside again, then it will stop. And then he will see it struggling again and struggling again, and then it will stop. So it's getting tired. So he went to get a tiny scissors. And he came and snipped the cocoon open. And the butterfly just came out. But when it came out, it was looking ugly. 
Its body was swollen. It couldn't spread out its wings to fly. And it kept waiting. It kept waiting. A couple of minutes, the body was already stiff. You know, insects, one of the characteristics of insects, for those students who are still going to do exam, is that they have an exoskeleton of cheating, right? It hardens. Their own skeleton is not inside the body. Their skeleton is outside the body. Skeleton is what gives structure to us. It allows us to move. So their own skeleton is external. And the breeze, the air, quickly hardened the body of that butterfly. It was ugly. It was misshapen. They had liquid all over its body and it was bloated. It was never able to fly. It was never able to fly. In fact, the butterfly kept moving around for days until it died. By hobbling around, couldn't fly, it wasn't beautiful, it was ugly. And the mother was shocked what happened. And the, son, the boy too was surprised. So they took that butterfly before it died, of course. And they went to a scientist to find out because the boy was obviously heartbroken. What happened? Why didn't this butterfly develop? Why did the butterfly come out looking this? And the scientist told the boy, that struggle that you observe of the butterfly trying to come out of the cocoon was designed by God for its good. It is in struggling that it developed strength in its limbs, that all the liquid in its body will fill out and enter all the tiny spaces in its wings, that the wings will come out like this. It's needed to go through that struggle to come out of that cocoon to emerge a beautiful butterfly. But because you thought that struggle was not necessary, you felt pity and out of kindness, misguided of course, you went and thought you were helping it to save it from that struggle. You wanted to help God in what he designed to do. And that's why the butterfly is like that. It was designed and supposed to go through that struggle. Now that's the story taken from nature, but it has an amazing, amazing lesson for us. The pupa was a misshapen, black, dry, you know, something. What entered it was a tiny little worm that could only crawl in small, small inches. But what was going to come out at the end when it comes out of that pupa stage was a beautiful butterfly that could fly. Imagine the transformation from a caterpillar to the beautiful butterfly. And God designed that it can only happen after that caterpillar goes through a moment of dormancy and it requires struggle to come out. And from that struggle, it becomes that beautiful butterfly. Oftentimes our lives are like that. For that caterpillar to have the gift of becoming a butterfly, it needed to go through a necessary struggle. That's why I titled my sermon as I said to you, are you ready for his gifts? Because in the end of today, I'm trying to let us understand that oftentimes we wonder why we go through struggles. Or when we're going through difficulties or struggles, it often makes us feel as if things are bad. Sometimes parents thinking they want to shield their children from struggle, they want to protect them from some of the stresses or the trials they went through, to become who they are, do not know that what they're doing is they are crippling and weakening the ability of their children to be the kind of people they want them to be. Struggle oftentimes is necessary for us to be able to get the gifts of God. Again, let me tell you a second story. This one is very short, we all know it. A lady gets pregnant, a woman gets pregnant. The time when the woman is pregnant, her energy levels reduce. She cannot run as she used to do. She cannot work as much as she used to do. She is more vulnerable at that point in time. As the belly keeps on swelling, so her energy and her strength also continues to fall. And then the lady wants to deliver. The process of delivering a baby is often painful. I have seen, I've been in the hospital where ladies are screaming, ah, Lord, blue walk going, and shouting and insulting the man who got the pregnant. I have seen a case where the lady was about to deliver, 
And the man was fanning her because she was hot. And he said, please, sorry. So don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. I know that one personally. I'm just saying, oh. I said someone, I knew someone. Okay? But when the baby comes out, how many women have their baby? Having gone through a 30 hour labor. Ah, you just lose this baby that just caused me all this pain. They are just eager to carry that baby and hold it to their person, isn't it? And as they see the baby growing and moving around, that is like they're amazing, the best kids anybody can give them. That's already a miracle. But they have to, why do women have to go through those pain? Why is the process of delivery have to be that difficult? Why do they have to be vulnerable, weak? You know, if there is a crisis and people are running away to escape, and there are nine pregnant women and nine non-pregnant women, who are the ones you think will be left behind? Is it not the nine pregnant ones? Yet it's, it's a gift that they have in them, isn't it? It's a miracle that is a blessing, and yet it makes them vulnerable. It's a necessary part of receiving that gift. Even Jesus Christ, in Matthew 24, talking about the coming of himself. He said you should pray that it doesn't happen during winter. And he says, woe to someone who is pregnant during that time. My final story is what we will look at in detail, okay? And this is, of course, from the scripture. So let's turn to the book of Numbers chapter 13. I've given you a story written by an individual. I've given you a story that we are familiar with every day happening. Now let's look at one in scripture and use it to explain and lay out and answer the question whether we are ready for the gifts of God. Whether we are ready for the gifts of God. Sometimes we don't understand why God allows difficulties and stress into the life of his children. In fact, nature has a lot of lesson for us on why and how God often will build difficult situations before something amazing is received. Numbers chapter 13 from verse 1. Numbers 13 from verse 1. And I'm going to read all the way to number 20. Verse number 20, okay? And this is interesting. I know we've all read this before, but I'm hoping I can bring in a little bit of perspective, retrospection, so to say, in reading this story. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, So who spoke here? The Lord. That is the first thing I want you to note. It was God who said to Moses. He gave him an instruction. It wasn't an idea that came upon Moses. It was God. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. My second emphasis. So they were to send out people, one from each tribe. It was God who gave that instruction that his instigation is from God. And most importantly, they were to pick leaders, what they call KOLs, key opinion leaders, people who can move the people, people who can influence people, right? God said to Moses, select leaders from among these people and let them go out. What are they supposed to go and do? So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them who were heads of the children of Israel, emphasizing my second point. Now you can jump through all the names of all these people and jump to verse number 17 to see the purpose, apparent purpose. Because if I were to ask you, why did God send Moses that kind of instruction? Why did he tell him to select people, not just people anyway, leaders of the people to go into the land of Canaan that he said he was going to give to them. Why would God send them? You know what the obvious answer is? Of course, the ones scout it and to know, you know, how the land is, right? That was not what we think, especially when we read verse 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, 
where there are the cities, verse 19, the habit are like calms or strongholds. Whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruits of the land. Now the time was the season of the first grapes. So, God sent an instruction to Moses, commanding him to select leaders who will go into the land of Canaan and go spy it out. Pause. Was that the reason why, if it were Moses' opinion now, as you mean, it's I said, and Moses decided and said, let us select leaders from among us who will go and spy out the land. It makes sense, right? Because Moses is a human being, and it's, it's good strategy to go ahead and see how the lay of the land is, is it not? That's good strategy. But this is God. Are you telling me God doesn't know how the land was? You think God needed to know whether the people were strong or weak? Did God need to know whether the lands are fortified or not? Whether they were using calms or strongholds? Whether it was fertile or not? Flowing with milk and honey or not? Did God need that information? Because note, it was God who said, Moses, I need you to select 12 men from among the leaders and let them go and spy out the land. Right? Actually, God didn't say to go and spy out the land. God just said, let them go into the land. Let's read again. Send men to spy out the land. Right? So, that was coming from God. Isn't it? Because some would say, no, nah, God just said, go send the people there. I've heard that. People say, no, God told him to send people there. It was Moses who said, let them spy it out. But I said, but well, look at what we see. God actually didn't say, let them go and spy it out. So God needed that information. Advanced knowledge. To know how the land was, right? I don't think so. I don't think so. We have examples of many times in the scripture that the children of Israel are going to a land. You know, the Bible says God speaks to Moses' heart as a man speaks to his neighbor, face to face, directly, periodically. You really think God, who knows all things, or in, but maybe in this case, he doesn't really know how the land was. Maybe he's been busy with the children of Israel in Egypt, protecting them, trying to get them out of Egypt. His attention has been focused there that he has not really been focusing on the children of Canaan, right? Doesn't know how the land was. Of course not. So what is the reason? What was that thing that was important enough for God to ask them to do that? We know that many, many, many times, <clears throat> many, many times, God had given Moses advanced information about the lands he was going, telling him what he should do to them, and how they were going to do this, how they were going to do that. So why couldn't God have told Moses what the land was like? Again, if you look at the results, did the going to spy out the land provide any information that was useful in how God was going to give them that land? So what is the purpose of that exercise? There's a very famous CIA director. His name was um, Alan W. Dobbs. Alan W. Dobbs. He wrote a book that is called The Craft of Intelligence. Now CIA, they are sort of like oversee a lot of espionage or spy operations across the globe. So you need to have strategy. You have to be able to plan, counter plan, and anticipate other people's, you know, actions and reactions so that you can also be able to do your own and come out victorious. I mean, so he, in his book, The Craft of Intelligence, he also decided to examine that account. That it is somehow, I mean, a powerful God who knows all things, who sees things before they happen, who is all knowing, all supreme. Why, what is the sense, what is the strategic importance of sending out leaders? If anything happens to those leaders, what will happen to the people they are going to be? Desire, isn't it? You want to win a battle, like you are playing chess. What's your game? Go after the punch, right? No, you go after the king, you go after the queen, and all the big, big ones. The leaders are the ones you take out. So what, what strategic value does it have to send out leaders who are the ones who can influence and hold the people together? When people don't have leaders, they behave like mobs, like area boys, more or less. 
But when you have a leader to focus them, to give them vision and direction, to rally around, people are more organized, more focused. So why risk the leaders to go and do that? Why not spend young men who can fight, who also are expendable in a sense? Why the leaders? It didn't make sense to Alan Dawes that there has to be a strategic importance. And so in looking at it, he said, okay, from studying that account and all the other accounts of how God was relating with Moses and the rest of the children of Israel, he realized the value of sending out those spies was not to know what the land was like, was not the reason Moses said. It was not to know whether the place was fertile or not. It wasn't primarily because he wanted to know whether he had good strongholds or they were living in camps. It wasn't to know whether the people are many or they are few. What God wanted was not intelligence about the land. You know what God wanted? He wanted to give the children of Israel the entire land. He knew what was there. He knew how fertile it was. But to give them that gift, he needed what is called humans. God needed humans about his people. Human intelligence about the people. He wanted to know whether his own people will go and do what he wants them to do in spite of whatever difficulties they may be facing. So he wants to give them a gift. He wants to give them a reward. He wants to accomplish a lot in their lives. But before that, he wanted them to see what difficulties may be in front of them and whether they have the wherewithal to say we will still go ahead and do that which he wants us to do. He wanted human intelligence about his people. How will they react? What will they do in difficult situations? If everything is okay, normally people will laugh and be happy. But when things doesn't look like it's okay, can people still trust me? Can people still do what I expect them to do, go forward, when they can see all the challenges they will face? That was the reason why God sent them. I tend to agree with that analysis of Mr. Dobbs because it makes perfect sense. God does not need intelligence about the land. He knows what is there. He knew what was there. He knew what they were going to face. But he wanted the people to see it. And he needed intelligence, information about the state of their heart. What will they do? God has decided somehow that before he will give gifts to people, before he will reward, promote, and provide for in abundance. He wants people, he wants people to go through a period of some challenge. And for people to see those challenge and still trust and rely on him. He will not give us gifts. He will not open doorways for us. Unless he has understood that we are willing to go through some challenges or difficulties. Incidentally, the challenge for this children of Israel then, was to go into that land and see how beautiful it was. The cities are huge, fortified cities. Maybe they have only tents they were living in. But those people have three-story buildings, four-story buildings. Their roads were paved. The people were well-fed and they had muscles. Their soldiers had armor over them. There was a mental challenge there that they needed to overcome before God will give them that reward. But the children of Israel, the 10 leaders who went, the 12 leaders who went, 10 of them, 10 of them didn't want to go through those challenges. And they came back and because they were leaders, their opinion was able to influence the people. And only Joshua and Caleb were willing to say, you know what? Yeah, these people are like this. Yes, this land is difficult. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are difficulties. But with God on our side, we will eat them like bread. We will drink tea with them. Move them around in our mouth and gargle with them and just swallow them up. And God decided to postpone what he was going to do. He said 20 years and above, age of maturity, 20 years and above said they will all die in the wilderness. 
and only their children will accomplish it. I need you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. We can't say this more, okay? Our daily lives oftentimes are full of struggles. In one way or the other, we face mental, physical challenges. So there's no amount of saying and encouragement or words that will help us to be able to cope and understand what God is doing. That is too much. There's no amount of time we'll say that is like said too much. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, or chapter 8, from verse 2, we'll read something there. It tells us the mind of God that God always likes to test us. He likes to pass out, put us through tests and trials. A kind of challenge. Before he would give us something great. He always wants to give us gifts. He says, my plans for you are great plans. Jesus Christ says, my father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. He said, even before we ask anything of God, he knows what we need. He said, if we ask anything from him, and we do so diligently, say, he will speedily answer us. But he likes to test us. He likes to put us through some form of challenge, difficulties, some stress. And he wants to see whether we are prepared for that blessing he wants to give us. For that gift he wants to give us. For that reward. And the ultimate reward, of course, we know, is to reign with his son, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. But even in this life, like it says, like Paul told Timothy, godliness and contentment is great gain. And it's profitable for life now in the world to come. Christ said, if you lose mother, father, brother, sister, land, or anything for my sake, say you will gain it a hundredfold now in this life. And the world to come eternal life. So, verse 2 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you. He wanted to test the children of Israel, even those who survived. So he tested their parents and they failed. And he decided to walk with them. Now that walking with them was a challenge in its own. For 14 years, I can imagine them passing a particular location and camping there. And someone who was maybe 10 years old when they passed there is now 19 years old or 12 years old or 14 years old. Hey, Dad. I think we passed there some time ago because I remember when our when we killed one ram. I took the horn and I used to carve something on this rock. This is still the rock. We passed there 10 years ago or 8 years ago. And then 15 or 10 years later, they will pass there again. Wow, this was where we buried the grandfather. This was where we buried uh, my auntie. This was where the gravestones are still there or the signs are still there. It's like they were just going round and round in circles. 40 years. To enter a promised land. Then that's a challenge on its own, isn't it? Of course, God did say that their sandals did not wear off, their coat, their clothes did not fall off. He fed them, manna, 40 years, monotonous, same things, like eating rice, morning, afternoon, evening, morning, afternoon. For some people, that's okay. For some people, ah, you wear rice yesterday, yesterday now. Yeah, but that's yesterday now. Today is different. For some people, ah, wear rice yesterday, I'll tell you something else today. And those, those in, it, in itself are challenges, right? Those are challenges. So he said he did that to, to test them, to know what was in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or not. It now depends on how we will say. Sometimes we think when we go through challenges, it's because God is trying to check whether we are good enough for what he wants to give us. Actually, he's actually trying to test whether we are ready for what he wants to give us. He's not interested in seeing whether we will fall or not. Oh, let me see whether we will pass. What is that? that is not the aim. The aim is not to see whether we will fall, whether we are good enough, whether we are going to measure up. That's not the aim of God allowing us to go through testing. His aim is much more noble. It's not looking for our downfall or our mistakes. That's not the aim. Because sometimes we think that is the reason why we go through this difficulties and trials. We want to see whether I'm strong enough. We want to see whether I have faith. But that's not really him. He's trying to be sure we are ready to receive his gift. You know what happens when you get something that you are not ready for? 
it becomes a curse. It doesn't become a blessing. Give a child a knife so that he can cut his bread. What's that child likely to do with that knife? He will cut his hand and enjoy himself, isn't it? Go buy a car for a child or a man or a young man who is not mentally ready for a car and they will drive that car and have an accident because they are not ready for it. When you want to give a great gift to someone, they need to be ready for it so that it will truly be a gift that will be a blessing to them. And God says he wants to bless us. Sometimes we miss that fact that his, his plan, his aim, his goal is to bless us. There's no father who will have a child and will not want to give the best. Do you think any of you with parents, with children here, what do your children need to do for you to run to protect them? If you hear that they are in trouble, imagine if you can see them all the time. You can even see what they can't see. Perhaps, maybe on a CCTV camera, you are constantly looking at them. And they're just walking along on their own. Yeah, 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 they're just walking. And they didn't know that there's a car coming from the corner. And then they're just coming and they're reading their phone and they're walking and they're going to the road. And there's a car coming with speed and they're going to cross that road. And you can see that this car is going to intersect with them at the time they're crossing. How many of us who are parents will say, hmm, a useless child? Okay? Can you imagine walking and pressing phone, not even looking at the road? Okay. He has not even said, God, protect me. He not say that, he come and save me. Hey, let the car hit him. He will learn. How many of you would do like that? How many parents would do that? We won't. How much more God? He who said, I will give men's life and ransom for you. So he wants to give us good gifts. But more importantly, God wants to be sure we are ready for it. And yet, we are busy oftentimes chasing those gifts that he wants to give us so readily. And yet he just wants to be sure that when the going gets tough, we will still get going. He wants to know we are ready for this gift. You know how many people, the gift that God gives them is what takes them away from him, from trusting God. So, as I said today, I want us to keep asking ourselves this question. Every time, am I ready for God's gift? Am I preparing myself to get the gift he wants to give us? It's not just even the physical ones, because yes, he does want to bless us. Third John 2 says, I wish that I will prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, right? But he wants to give us amazing gift that we will reign and rule with his son. Revelation 5.10 says we shall reign with Christ. We shall reign with him on the earth. The kingdoms of this world are going to be given to the saints of God. He wants to give us amazing benefits, amazing blessing. Jump a little bit from that Deuteronomy chapter 8 where you are to verse 15. Still in the same vein, Deuteronomy 8 from verse 15. Perhaps, maybe we should read from verse 11. Beware, verse 11, that you do not forget the Lord your God. By not keeping his commandments, his judgment, his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and you are full, and you have beautiful houses and dwell in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led you, verse 15, through that great and terrible wilderness, He's talking of a deliberate leading. He didn't say who made you pass. He led them. You know, this is more, more clear when you consider that when they left Egypt, God did not tell Moses, send the children of Israel to go ahead and spy out the best routes to get to Canaan. To Canaan. Is the Red Sea dry or not dry? God just told them, go this way and that's where they go. When he stops, they stop. When he moves, they move. He led them without any advanced knowledge. No spies, to go, no, nobody to go ahead and spy out the land. He just led them deliberately to the edge of the Red Sea. Again, that brings out, that brings out the issue of why he sent them, asked them to send spies. It's not because he needed that knowledge, that information. 
It was them. It was them that God wanted to get information about. Whether they were ready for the gifts he wants to give them. He led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water. Who brought water for you out of the flinty rock? Verse 16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. To do you good in the end. And then you say in your heart, when people have gifts that they have not proven they were ready for, they will say in their heart, my power and the might of my hand have given me this word. Oh, it's by my work, by my energy, by my dedication, by my strength, my intelligence, my whatever it is. They will think that's how they got it. They will not understand it was God who gave them. And for his children, he often allows us to go through difficult situations and trials. So does it, does it test us this way? Of course it does. I want to look at a couple of scriptures again to show this, to portray this, okay? Turn to Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. And we're going to read verse 4. Exodus 16, verse 4. This was shortly after the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. They were going to that place where God had promised them to receive the gift and the blessing. But God said something in verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. My emphasis is on this last part, what they will call foresee that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. You know, in the New International Version, it says, in this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. So God says he will test them. He tests us. He wants to know, not just because he wants to see whether we will fail or not. No, he wants to be sure that we are ready for what he wants to give us. He wants to be sure to know that our heart is where it should be. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Let's read verse 3. Again, Moses' instruction. In this chapter 13, Moses was talking about people individually knowing and studying and knowing God's will. He's talking about when they have someone among them who is a reputable prophet, and he is telling them he can see a vision, and in telling them of what he saw, the thing came to pass. And then he now starts telling them to do that which God hasn't said. But how can they know that that's not what God has said? Unless people themselves are doing what? They are reading God's word. And he says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, verse 3. For the Lord your God is testing you. So it's like I will let them show you something spectacular that you cannot identify with. And then I will now bring out something that is not from my word and let them say something that's not from my word. And you guys, I want to know whether you will listen to what I say. It's like saying, understand God, understand my words, understand my word. Say God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So he does test us. Look at the number of times in the scriptures. Just take, take your time, study the Bible well. There is one writer called Mike Mordor, who used to write a lot of things on wisdom, who will say that every trouble, every trial is always a sign that there is a promotion or there is a gift that is coming in the corner. And that's not just his words. He said those, but it's actually scriptural. Read those words of his when I was about 16 years old. He's the same man who said people take a lot of time and waste so much energy, busy chasing money. Rather than them looking for problems that they can solve, learn how to solve problems. 
When you solve problems for people, then money will come. The same way, the gifts and the blessing and the rewards that God wants to give us, we didn't do anything to deserve them. We don't need to actually beg Him for them. He did say we should ask, seek, and not. But He wants to give us. But more than that, He wants to be sure we are ready. And the way often God determines our readiness is by allowing us to go through tests and difficulties and trials. It is knowing that those tests are preparing us for the gifts of God that can make a difference in whether we will give up or will choose to go our own way and truly show what's in our heart. That yes, this is where our heart really is. In Genesis 22, I'm not going to turn there, alright? God told Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, whom he loved, and sacrifice him. What do we think that is? It's a test. What was the reward that he was being prepared for? To be the father of many nations. The one through whom salvation and blessing will come to all human beings. To be the original source through whom the seed, Jesus Christ, will come. Because it is after he has passed that test. Maybe you should read that portion. Genesis 22 verse 16. Genesis 22 verse 16. It was in verse 12 that God said, Now I know that you will love me and fear me and obey my commandments. Now I know. You passed that test. I can see that you are ready. Okay? You've gone through these difficulties. You've gone through these trials. And your heart was steady. I wanted to know what was in your heart. Deep down. When things are okay, you will praise my name from heaven to kingdom come. Hallelujah. When things are difficult, oh God, why should I just happen to me? God, I don't know what is your problem. What have I done? Please now. If you don't do this thing for me by next week, I, no, see, I have an option so. He wants to know what's in our heart. Heart. God wants to know what's in your heart, what's in my heart, what's in our heart. That's important for him to give us a gift. So let's prepare our heart, ourselves to be ready to get his gifts, his rewards. Verse 16. And God said, and he said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. What thing? And have not withheld your son, your only son. See? That was a test. A really tough one. A child you waited for for decades. And you've watched grown up, grow up, playing with, feeding, interacting with. Take him and go sacrifice him for him. That was tough. Really. God said, because you have not withheld your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So he had that test to prepare him and show that he was ready to receive the gift. So what is the test or trial? that God may be putting you and I through. Our tests and our trials are very different. God knows us, knows that which really would burn us, which are more important, things most important to us. Those are the things that we use to test us. And unfortunately, the one he uses to test us rejoices in testing us and making us cry. That's the devil. You know how eager the devil was to test Job? Ah, God, you know, it's like saying, God, forget that thing you said. You know, forget that thing, forget that one, forget that one. You mean this guy, no problem. Nothing that happened to him. You say, I beg, God, leave that one. Yeah, you think that because of all those ones that, uh, that I'm blessing. Okay, go on. Ooh, let me go and deal with that guy. Ah! And they will run. And take joy in that test, in that trial. God doesn't take this. He doesn't take joy in those tests. He doesn't take joy in those trials. You know when he finally was talking to the devil? He said, see what you have caused me to do to my servant Job. He accepted responsibility for it. But
But you see, what happened afterwards? Because Job passed all those tests. Double blessings. He got double blessings. Let's read it a little bit. Let's just read down Job 42. Quickly. Job 42, verse 10. Job 42, verse 10. God blessed him doubly. And the Lord restored Job's losses. When he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job 42, verse 10. He passed those tests. His heart was in the right place. And he was ready, that's what he showed by, those, by, by, by his actions, he was ready to receive God's blessing. He was ready to receive God's blessing. There are so many scriptures, but I'll show you just one more, and then end this message. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse 1. Judges chapter 3, from verse 1. Remember, the focus is that when we are going through difficult situations, when we seem to be facing challenges, the focus is not to know whether we will fail or pass. Okay? The focus is to be sure that we are ready to go to the next level. We're ready to get the blessing and the reward God wants to give us. The students who sit for exam and for test, it's not because the teachers want to see whether they will pass or fail. No, that's not it. Even though that's inherent in any test, okay? But that's not the focus. That's not the reason. You know, if a teacher wants us to fail an exam, they can set an exam that the answer, no matter the answer you give, is wrong, right? And there are some teachers who may be like that, but God is not like that. In fact, the Bible says every time he gives us a test or allows us to go through a trial, he says he will also provide a way of escape. He will give us, the one who will carry the expo and come and give us, more or less, because he rules for us. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Our lawyer is Jesus Christ. And the judge who carries out the sentence is God. Unfortunately, the devil is at number because the judge and the lawyer, they are in support of the accused. All the accused needs to do is to simply surrender. And oh no. And they will strike out and wipe the slate clean. So, let's read from verse 1. After the death of Joshua, Judges chapter 3, from verse 1, sorry. Now, Judges chapter 3 from verse 1. And this all happened after Joshua had died. These are the nations which the Lord left. He left some nations behind that he might test Israel by them. That is all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. So their fathers were afraid of wars. They didn't want to die in wars. That's why they rebelled. Ah, these people are like giants. They will kill us. We're like cockroaches. We cannot do it. So I beg, we could go back to Egypt and enjoy ourselves there. So they had gone through, and God had done a lot with them. He now said he left some nations so that he might test them. This was only so that generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who are not formally known it. Jump to verse 4. Just not to read the names of all those nations. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. The essence was not to see whether they would pass or fail. It's really to be sure because, you see, is it Jeremiah, is it Deuteronomy 429? So when God said, look, see these holy righteous laws I've given you. Laws by which you might live. So God wants to know whether they were going to do that which would give them the blessing, the prosperity, and the good things, and the good life he wants for them. The essence is not whether they will fail, whether they will pass. No, it's to be sure they were ready. Imagine promoting a child from primary two to primary four. 
and the child does not yet know the thing they're supposed to know in primary two. When he gets to primary three or primary four, and they're having regular classes, and it's like overwhelmed, the child cannot just comprehend. Simply because the child had not yet understood the things they were supposed to understand in primary three. Or if you want to be negative, or maybe not as negative, oh, he has not yet passed primary three, right? But the essence is that the test is not to determine whether, is he worthy of going to primary three? No, they want to uh, primary four. They want to push this child to primary four. They want him to be in primary four because they have taught him for, for months, right? So this test that they are setting is that we are taking this boy or this girl to primary four, next level, a reward, a promotion. But we want to be sure he or she is ready for all the benefits and all the challenges of that level, of that class. It's the same with God in his relation with us. Sometimes when we are faced with difficult situations and we have to decide whether we want to do what God wants or what he says, even if it looks as if this is difficult. You know, this is challenging. This might cost us something. It might bring some pain. It might bring some trouble. There may be some ridicule in it, but it is right to do so. Then let us face that, which God allows us to do. Because in all the challenges and the tests we will face, God is simply trying to prepare us to receive the reward he wants to give us. So when we're going through difficult situations, we're going through different challenges, we should often be asking ourselves, what is the purpose of this? What can I learn from this? How strong will this make me? How more equipped, how better an individual will, we, will it make me? And we're asking God to give us that strength to give us that heart, that mind, to understand, to know, and to endure it, and to go through it, and to successfully come out so that the blessing, the reward, the promotion they want to give us, we will get it. So, brethren, are we ready for God's gifts? Are we ready to receive the abundance, the promotion, and the blessing he wants to give us? If we are, then let us hunker down. And with patience and with faith and trust, endure all that we go through. Because it is his pleasure to give us everything, the world and his kingdom. Shabbat shalom. Yeah.